Hello everyone, this is Dr. Bell, and today we're going to be talking about gut health and the importance of having a healthy GI system. I think people a lot of times assume that it's normal to have gut issues or normal to have digestive issues, but there are some signs that this may not be a good health condition to be in. And some of those things that you would wanna look out for would be feeling tired or wanting to lose weight, trying to lose weight and just can't, or you have poor digestion, meaning you have either loose bowels or you're, you're having trouble going to the bathroom like constipation, um, or you just don't go frequently enough. Also fatigue is very common or having intense food cravings, sugar being one of them. A lot of times when insulin levels start to fluctuate in the wrong way, we can have intense cravings for sugar. We also see brain fog being very common, and in some cases where we have hormonal related issues, we can also have low libido because sometimes gut issues can affect our, our hormones as well. You might have heard of something called the SAD diet or what we call the standard American diet. And if you pay attention to any research or sometimes, sometimes even watch the news, you'll see that very frequently, Americans get targeted as uh, having poor diets or having high rates of obesity, or you'll see things like if you ever travel to Europe, um, you'll see American fast food stores all over the place. And a lot of times that's what's contributing to uh, other societies becoming overweight as well, because our fast food restaurants are imparting the American type diet onto cultures that traditionally have never eaten these types of foods. So a lot of things are toxic to the body, but some of the big ones that are very common are MSG, high fructose corn syrup, uh, trans fats, and also sugars. It's been said that 85% of all diseases can be linked to gut health. And in functional medicine, this is one of the most common things that we deal with uh, in patients in terms of their complaints or things that they have that are causing other diseases. So we call that the root cause. And so some of the things you will see are IBS, which is a very common term you hear uh, all over the place these days. IBS has a lot of gas, bloating, abdominal pain, constipation, and diarrhea associated with it. You can also have something called dysbiosis, which is an imbalance of gut bacteria. The acronym SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that's where the small intestine, which isn't supposed to have a large amount of, of bacteria, has a disproportionate amount. And you have trouble uh, with foods. You have a lot of food sensitivities and a lot of uh, nutrient imbalances as well, because a lot of the nutrients we eat in our foods are absorbed in the small intestine. Candida is very common, especially with antibiotic use. And then there's other autoimmune diseases like celiac disease, Crohn's disease. Um, and again, in general, food intolerances and sensitivities a lot of times can be linked to gut health. And when we see patients improve their gut health, we also see their ability to eat a more variety of foods or foods that they were sensitive to before, they're no longer sensitive to. Gut health also can be linked to joint pain and fibromyalgia, also allergies, and then I, I also mentioned briefly autoimmune disorders. Anytime we're having a discussion of gut health, essentially what we're discussing is some sort of inflammatory process going on. Sometimes you've heard of a term called leaky gut, or there'll be other conditions where we have inflammation in, in the gut or the bowels. And inflammation is very beneficial to our body. It's one of the ways that our bodies signal stem cells to heal or signal our brain that we need to have some sort of a healing response happen. So there's two types, there's acute and chronic. And acute is necessary because that's what helps the body repair itself. So this would be if you, you know, are using a hammer and you accidentally hit your thumb and your, and your thumb swells, or you have a cut and it becomes infected, that inflammation will bring white blood cells and repair cells to, to help your body overcome the effects of that inflammation. But where we start to run into trouble is where we have what's called chronic inflammation. And this is a 
long-term low-grade inflammation. This is linked to chronic disease, and that's one of the biggest endemics or pandemics in our society right now, at least in my opinion. And when we talk about a chronic disease, the types of diseases we're speaking of are going to be heart disease, diabetes, obesity, insulin resistance, high blood pressure, uh, high blood sugar, leaky gut, uh, joint pain. There's a whole list of chronic diseases. And largely, pharmaceutical intervention does not do a very good job when it comes to dealing with chronic disease and chronic inflammation. So you'll hear the term leaky gut, especially around the office here, you'll, you'll hear us talking about this all the time. Leaky gut in a traditional Western medical sense isn't largely understood. Not that it doesn't exist, but because it's subclinical, it's very hard to diagnose by taking a blood test or getting a colonoscopy or doing something where we can put our finger on it. Now, truth be told, there are things that we can look at on a blood test that could indicate that you have leaky gut. But essentially, what we understand and believe about leaky gut in functional medicine is that the intestinal mucosal cells are supposed to be very tightly connected together. As we ingest toxins and we expose ourselves to chemicals and we take medications and things that irritate the lining of the gut, the cells in the gut start to swell, they, they become misshapen, they spread apart, and this allows toxins and bacteria and viruses that aren't supposed to enter our bloodstream. It allows it to leak into the bloodstream. Some of these things can cause autoimmune diseases. It can certainly lead to cardiovascular disease. It can prevent vitamins and minerals from being absorbed. And then in certain cases, some of these pathogens and, and bacteria and viruses can cross over what's called the blood-brain barrier, which can lead to that term brain fog that you can hear so often. So leaky gut is something that we strongly believe exists in, in a lot of patients. And if we can help improve leaky gut, then a lot of times we can see drastic changes, sometimes within days or weeks with patients, just by uh, tightening up those junctions in the gut. So in any discussion of suspected leaky gut or digestive issues, one of the first things that we're going to ask a patient is, how much gluten do you consume or do you have a known gluten sensitivity? Gluten is found in wheat, barley, and rye. And thanks to a very interesting research article about 50 years ago or 40 years ago, uh, the, the government decided to issue a proclamation, so to speak, and it, it came out in the form of this thing called a food pyramid. And what it largely did is it basically said that the largest portion of foods that you should you should consume should be grains like breads rice pastas those those types of things but not necessarily in terms of rice but in when it comes to things like wheat barley and rye the protein and gluten is very resistant to the digestive enzymes in our stomachs and in our intestines. And so it's very hard to break down in our bodies, which leaves a very large amino acid chain that basically cannot be broken down by our bodies. Our body recognizes that as something foreign, which can trigger an immune response. And then this has all kinds of other ramifications. And so the reason you're seeing a lot of gluten-free products and uh, gluten-free, even like you go to like a, a pizza uh, restaurant and you now you very commonly will see cauliflower, uh, you know, crust or gluten-free crust. It's because so many people are sensitive to it and it causes a, it causes a lot of issues like we've already talked about with um, autoimmune disorders, constipation, diarrhea, skin issues, headaches are very common, joint pain and swelling. And so if you ingest gluten and you have any of those types of symptoms immediately after or sometimes even 24 to 48 hours after, that's when most people get affected by gluten. Um, you, if you get 
unexplained headaches or skin rashes or itchiness, that could be an indicator that you have a sensitivity to gluten. So another product or a group of products that can trigger leaky gut and IBS is dairy. And dairy has a protein called casein, which is, again, a very large protein. It takes a lot of enzymes to digest. And most people don't even have the enzymes to digest dairy after the age of four. So very similar to gluten, if you have a dairy sensitivity, you either probably already know it or suspect it. Um, but you'll have things like gas, bloating, diarrhea. You won't see excess mucus production in your gut, but it would actually show up on some of the testing that we do. Some common symptoms of dairy sensitivity or dairy intolerance is going to be itching, uh, hives, uh, swelling of the face, uh, wheezing, coughing, especially in kids. If their parents are giving them a lot of dairy products and they have asthma or they have trouble breathing, it's usually because they've continued to give them dairy after the age of four or so when the body stops producing the enzymes needed to break down uh, the, the casein protein. So again, 85% of people cannot digest dairy after age four. Dairy also triggers an immune response, which can be noticeable or, or unnoticeable in some people. And the leading cause of IBS and leaky gut is going to be dairy. We could literally probably do a two hour presentation just on sugar and how it affects the body, but we'll keep it real brief here. Um, sugar, drains energy, triggers leaky gut. Main thing with sugar is it can cause insulin spikes. So if you're ingesting more than 40 grams of sugar per day, that's gonna be the equivalent of one can of soda or a candy bar or nine teaspoons of sugar essentially is what 40 grams of sugar equals. The problem with that is that your pancreas is forced to produce excessive amounts of insulin. Sugar has to be broken down in your liver. And so when we have excess sugar, which most of us are consuming in America, anywhere from 150 to 300 grams of sugar per day, then what happens is excess sugar is raising triglyceride levels or causing the triglyceride levels to go up. And that's something that is uh, gonna show up on a blood panel. And so if you have high triglycerides, it, it's most likely going to be because of a sugar issue in many cases. Sugar also feeds bacteria. So this leads to excess intestinal overgrowth or excess bacterial overgrowth. And when we have excess sugar, it becomes toxic to our bodies. And the way that our bodies remove toxins is it tries to store them into cells. Well, those cells happen to be fat cells, and so excess sugar is going to get stored as fat. Toxins are going to get stored inside of fat molecules because it's going to allow the body to remove those from the bloodstream and protect us from those toxins. So weight gain is a major contributor to inflammation along with cardiovascular disease. And dietary fat, which has been made to be the enemy, Turns out it actually isn't the enemy. It has to do with high amounts of carbohydrate and sugar ingestion. Corn is an interesting one. Um, some people can tolerate it, some people can't. There are some general issues with corn, which puts it in the category of something that should be avoided. Main reason being that, at least in the United States, we don't use what's called heirloom corn, and so Corn in the U.S. is GMO or genetically modified. The genetic makeup of corn is similar to gluten, so it has very similar effects on the body as gluten. It's a very high glycemic in vegetables, so what that means is your body will convert the substances in corn to sugar. It raises your sugar levels, which causes insulin spikes. And anytime insulin spikes, that's also going to increase inflammation and lead to issues where we have to remove high levels of sugar from the body and store those in those fat cells.
So my research on, on soy would indicate that it should be something that should be avoided in most cases. There are some products that are soy based that are actually good as a prebiotic. Some people believe that fermented soy products like natto or even soy sauce is okay to consume. But in general, I would say we would want to avoid soy as much as possible. The evidence is there that it can interfere with thyroid. Most soy is genetically modified. It's well known that the phytates in soy can bind to nutrients and prevent nutrient absorption. And soy also has a high amount of lectins. So just like beans and, and grains and legumes, they're very difficult to digest. They can cause reactions in your body. And because of that, they can also contribute to leaky gut. This is just a short list of some of the most common things that we buy when we go to the grocery store. And so we'll just cover these very briefly here, but these are some of the major contributors of leaky gut and, and inflammation. Processed meats or deli meats, especially ones that contain nitrate or sodium nitrite, those are believed to be carcinogenic. And so if you can Avoid deli meat, it's it's always best, but if you do need to have deli meat or like deli meat, then try to find something that's nitrate free, uh, especially when it comes to bacon and, and uh, deli meats, hot dogs, things like that. Snack foods and junk food, kind of in the same category, but anything that comes in a box, it's gonna have low fiber, high sugar, usually uh, made with cheap oils and, and uh, whole flour. And again, these are all gonna be gluten type products you could possibly throw in the gluten-free products just to avoid in general but but again if you do have to choose something try to pick something that's a, a gluten-free product vegetable oils especially the omega-6 containing vegetable oils this is going to be canola oil safflower oil sun sunflower oil uh, grapeseed oil anything that's that's not um, really olive oil Coconut oil or avocado oil; those are the only those are the only three that are good to ingest because we do have a high level of omega six fatty acid consumption, and that comes from vegetable oils. Artificial sweeteners like aspartame, sugar free drinks, diet drinks; those are those are really bad. They cause huge insulin spikes. Alcohol, uh, more than two drinks per day. And that might even be excessive because that would work out to be 14 drinks a week. But uh, excessive alcohol consumption is very hard on the liver, very hard on, on, on the digestive system and leads to a whole host of problems. Margarine, which is made from vegetable oils, it's heated to a very high degree of heat. And that high level of processing with heat actually turns the vegetable oil into a toxin. And then we ingest that as margarine, of course. So you want to look at like grass fed butters and things like that that are very safe and have actually very good health benefits. Candies, breads, pastas, pastries, cookies, cakes. I think those go without saying because, uh, of course, that falls in the category of sugar and gluten and everything else we talked about today. Antibiotics will wipe out not only the good bacteria, but the bad bacteria. So we definitely want to make sure that we don't overtake antibiotics. And it's one of the most overprescribed medications in our country. Also antacids, very common when we have heartburn to take a Tums or to take something that is supposed to put out the acid in our stomach. But what really when we look at patients and we look at blood testing, patients don't have enough stomach acid. So it seems counterintuitive and a lot of patients are like, what, wait, what, what do you mean I need to have more stomach acid, but I already have heartburn. But the idea is your body isn't producing enough stomach acid and that's why you have heartburn and indigestion and all, and all those types of things. And excessive avoidance of bacteria. So this would be overusing hand sanitizers and antibacterial soaps and and cleansing and scrubbing and those types of things. We have good and bad bacteria on our body, but when we use these types of products, it wipes out not only the bad, but also the good. Let's talk about chronic disease for just a moment. And I already mentioned briefly that 
it's one of the leading causes of uh, problems in our society. But it turns out that about one in two Americans suffers from a chronic disease. Seven out of every 10 illnesses is responsible or a result of a chronic disease. Arthritis is a chronic disease. Arthritis is also very heavily related to inflammation. So when patients wonder why they have arthritis and they've never been injured, injured or anything like that, it's usually because there's some sort of systemic inflammation going on in the body. Heart attack and stroke, cancer, diabetes, of course, that's a sugar handling problem, uh, and then obesity, which also has a very close relationship to, to diabetes. These are all inflammation related conditions. So essentially, if we handle inflammation, then really a lot of chronic disease can be reversed. And that's the good news. The majority of Americans have nutrient deficiencies, and it has to do with the types of foods that we consume. There's also things where you could argue that the rapid turnover of our crops and our farming practices and all these different things and that, that, are, that are happening with, with our food supply is leading to a decrease in the nutrients in the foods we absorb as well. But the big ones that we see are vitamin D and zinc, magnesium, uh, B vitamins deficiencies are very, very common. And so this is where multivitamins sometimes can have an effect. Supp supplementation can definitely be beneficial but it can also create toxicities as well. So um, that's why when we look at patients and we have our Avexia blood panel that we run, it gives us a good window into what specific nutrient deficiencies that a patient might be suffering from. And then we can tailor a program to help meet that patient's needs. If a majority of Americans are suffering from nutrient deficiencies, then a lack of nutrients is going to lead to a breakdown in our metabolism. And there is a process in the body called the Krebs cycle, which is how our body utilizes nutrients and really glucose for, for the most part. And when we have inflammation overload, then we have inefficient energy production and when we have inefficient energy production then we have an overproduction of lactic acid and this is going to cause chronic muscle and joint inflammation it's a leading cause of chronic pain syndrome or sometimes you hear it called chronic fatigue syndrome but it all circles back to inflammation overload and that starts to affect the body in in negative ways especially metabolically So as our body deals with toxicity, this puts our body into a state of stress. Some call it fight or flight, there's other words for it. But what's happening is glucose is inefficiently being broken down. And our body is going to be able to make glucose from several sources, carbohydrates being the most obvious one. Our body can also recycle proteins and break those down in, into uh, carbohydrates and fats to a lesser extent, but fats do provide a large amount of energy for our body. But when we have an inefficient metabolism, we have more waste and we have less energy produced from glucose. And then we have essentially really an inefficient system and we get a lot of breakdown of of, of the body's metabolism. And that's why you always hear about things like, you know, take this fat burner or take this thing that speeds up your, your metabolism or drink coffee or take caffeine. There's all these different things that we try to like compensate for this system. But if we can just get the inflammation down in our body, get that Krebs cycle to work correctly, it makes things a lot easier. You actually can, if you can fix this system, you can produce 32 times the amount of energy that you're normally making, and you can reduce the amount of lactic acid by 19 times just by improving the body's metabolism. We have two main organs that assist in purification of our body. Just the act of simply metabolizing the foods we eat can produce toxic waste, not to mention things like ingesting 
pesticides that are on our foods or bacterias and, 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 and pathogens that, that just kind of naturally exist in the foods that we eat, things that we ingest, stuff in the air, et cetera. It's, it's all over the place. So your liver, I always say, is the filter for the body. The liver filters toxins. It also metabolizes fat, protein, and carbohydrates. It takes all of these substances, good and bad, and will break them down into harmless particles or into particles that, that we can actually utilize in our body. Now, the kidneys also assist in this. The kidneys will be more responsible for things with the blood and filtering waste from the blood, but it also has a very important function of regulating the release of sodium, phosphorus, potassium, proteins, and things like that. And so we have ways to, to check this with blood testing. We, we actually can test the kidney filtration rate, and you'll sometimes hear us talk about this. But what that means is if, you're, if your kidneys are having trouble filtering, then that means your kidneys are actually having trouble removing things from, from the bloodstream. And so that, that actually can be a potentially very serious issue. And we want to make sure that both your liver and your kidneys are working as optimally as possible. When we suffer from a metabolism breakdown, we still have to function, we still have to thrive, we still have to survive. And the way that we do this is we ingest larger amounts of sugar. So it's no coincidence that when we have a toxic situation in our body, our bodies are suffering from obesity, we're suffering from chronic fatigue, and we have high consumption of sugar, high craving for sugar. I always make the joke that, uh, you know, you have to go for your your latte or your uh, sugar laden frozen frozen coffee at two in the afternoon because your body starts running out of fuel, and what happens is that's about the time your adrenal glands kick in and start to panic, and tell your and it tells your body that you need to get something in as quickly because we're running out of fuel. Well, this is exhaustive for your body. It leads to fatigue. It leads to difficulty sleeping. Uh, those toxins then, of course, when it's excessive, the body removes those and stores those as fats. So this is where obesity comes from. You can't eat enough food. You, you, you continue to consume, and it's this vicious cycle. And so the trick again, improve the metabolism, get the body to start burning the excess fat, and I'm going to use the word keto or ketosis that doesn't mean keto diet but basically what has to happen is your body has to take those fats that it got from sugar essentially and stored as fat now we have to reverse that and we have to go from stored fat break it back down into sugar so your body can get that fuel back and so this it's a whole process that that we go through with, with patients, but it's amazing to watch when people start to actually tap into that system because they with, start feeling better, they start sleeping better, uh, they, they of course start to lose weight and, and all, 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 all the things that go along with that. But at the same time, we see inflammation go down, we see fatigue go down, we see pain, joint aches and pains go away, and it's, it's really a fun process to watch unfold. I want to talk for a moment about the adrenal glands and this is your body's backup system and you may have heard of cortisol levels you're, you'll hear us talk about cortisol levels a lot in the office uh, fight or flight there's all kinds of different things that the adrenal glands are responsible for one of which being glucose management and so when we start to have high glucose or hyperglycemia or low glucose hypoglycemia or we have stress which can happen in a whole bunch of different ways and that's again is a whole nother talk that we could have the thing that the adrenal glands do is it moves sugar out of storage but if we have too much fight or flight or too much stress or like any hormone in the body if you over utilize it it doesn't have a chance to regenerate, then you start to get adrenal stress, adrenal overload. And these, again, subclinical things that don't show up on blood tests because when you talk about adrenal overload in the traditional medical world, world you're talking Addison's disease. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about fatigue, adrenal fatigue. 
and the body having to constantly use this system. This system will keep you alive. It will keep your thyroid alive. It will keep, if your thyroid isn't working, the adrenal glands are capable of compensating for a malfunctioning thyroid. So there's all kinds of different things that the adrenal glands do. And we need to make sure that we support the adrenals, that the adrenals can go and get some rest. Um, that way, what will happen is your body will be able to deal with stress a little bit better. So we have two main organs in the body that assist with purification. You may have heard of the small intestine. We talked about SIBO before, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then we have the large intestine. And so these two organs serve two separate functions, but they, they work together. The small intestine digests food so that nutrients can be absorbed into the blood and then transported to the liver. And the small intestine is also a barrier that blocks toxins from the rest of the body. We call the, the large intestine kind of the garbage disposal. Uh, that's the organ in the body that actually gets rid of, uh, you know, it, it brings water and electrolytes with the waste and then you excrete it from the body. There's also antibodies that are produced in the large intestine. And there's also bacterial compounds that create fatty acids and, and vitamins for nutritional support. So both of these organs are very important uh, that they work in conjunction with each other, that they're functioning properly, because this is the first line of defense or, or, or the first part of the body where your body begins to process the nutrients and absorb the nutrients. I can't even count the number of times that patients have come into the office and they say, I, I have such bad brain fog or I can't figure out why I'm gaining weight if I just look at food and I, I'm eating healthy, I'm exercising, or you know, my, my stress levels are so high that all I want to do you know, is just eat everything in sight, right? which is very, very common. And so we'll explain to patients that those labs are, are going to show up normal. And the reason is, is because normal labs only screen for pathology. Those lab ranges are the ranges that most people are going to function in. It's also the reason why you feel bad and you're being told that there's nothing wrong with you. So this is what I mean by the labs can be normal, but you're still feeling like there's something wrong. And so if you look at this diagram here, you can see there's a, this on, on the bar here, the, the red area, that's what's outside of the normal lab range. And so then inside of the lab range, there's this thing called the inaccurate lab range. Um, so that's when things are not normal, but it actually doesn't show up on the lab test. And then where we function most of the time is in what we call the functional lab ranges or the optimal ranges, which you'll see on some of the reports that we do um, when, when we run our functional lab tests. So you could be telling your doctor you're sick, but on the lab work, the doctor would not know necessarily why you're sick because they're only looking at those standard ranges that are designed to cover a broad base of patients and not an individual's uh, specific problems. So in a traditional medical approach or what we'll call a Western medical approach, this philosophy is based on the treatment of symptoms, meaning you have a problem and then you're given some sort of drug or injection or surgery to address the symptom, which is usually already happened after something has, has been going wrong for some time. So then the approach is to look at what condition you have and then what drugs do you need to address that condition. So this is how we are educated. This is why 60% of the commercials on TV educate you to think that you need a drug for a certain problem or for a certain issue that you're suffering with. And so the, the public by and large is educated to this sort of philosophy. And so for, for this type of philosophy then, because drug companies are a business, they, they are for profit, then thyroid medications, diabetes medications, to them, that means that you need to have prescription drugs for life. And that makes you a great customer for them.
In functional medicine, we look at what the underlying cause of a problem could be. There's four main things that influence your health that we'll always want to consider first, at least from a historical or a health history perspective, and that's going to be physical traumas, car accidents, slips, trips, and falls, things like that, stuff that's physically happened to your body. We also look at emotional stressors, uh, job stress, getting getting on social media too much, or you know having having trouble at home with your spouse or your loved one. Um, you know, it could be a lot of things can fall into the emotional realm, especially these days. We also have to consider chemically what you're doing to yourself. That could be drugs that you're taking. It could be food that you're eating. Um, it could be environmental exposures that you've had, maybe you've been in the military or uh, perhaps you work in a job where there's a lot of industrial exposure. And so chemicals can really affect the body uh, really very severely in some cases. And we also have to look at your immune system and how healthy is your body, how run down is it, and what is your body able to or not able to do because of a properly functioning or a malfunctioning immune system. So maybe you're asking yourself at this point, well, it sounds like there maybe is a better way to do this. Or maybe you've been asking yourself, what if there was a better way? I know there's something wrong with me and I know these labs aren't right. And that's, of course, obviously what we're talking about today. And that's the whole purpose of functional medicine is get to the true cause of, of what's going on with the gut. Uh, don't just treat the symptoms. Don't just take antacids, you know, or antibiotics or stool softeners or cleanses and all that stuff. Let's run those lab tests and let's see if we can really find out what the problem truly is in the gut. And then a lot of times we can also help uncover some other potential uh, health issues as well and things that are could be contributing to the gut issues. So ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to heal the gut. Everything that is done in this office is of course going to be done without prescription drugs, uh, you know, avoiding surgery when we can. It's obviously part of our, our mission statement and our, our core values and things like that. So we don't want to be invasive. We don't want to be doing anything more than just helping the body learn to function on its own as it's meant to be. That's the good news is we figured out a simpler way to help you recover gut health and reduce inflammation. There's two ways that you can approach your health. You can take a reactive approach, which essentially means that you're gonna wait until something shows up. So high blood pressure, cancer, diabetes, and then you decide to seek a health professional's advice and do something about it at that point. The other way that you can choose to take charge of your health is to be proactive. What that means is you function in a realm where you try to get out ahead of a problem. You you run regular labs even though you're not sick. You don't wait till you're sick. You look at things periodically on testing, maybe some genetic testing. There's all kinds of things that you can do to be proactive to avoid even having a problem in the first place. And that, of course, is where we like to um, help our patients is in that proactive realm. We want you to feel that you're empowered to take control of your health. And it's important that you learn to listen to your body. And if we can find the root cause of health problems, you really don't ever have to treat symptoms. And that's that's the beauty of this whole thing. So I said a little while ago that I had some diagrams on food pyramids. And the food pyramid on the right versus the food pyramid on the left are very different as, as you can see. And so the food pyramid on the left is the one that I was saying was more grain-based, and that's the one that came out in the 1970s. It said we should eat more grains and and more more starchy carbs and fats are bad, and we should eat a small amount of or a moderate amount of vegetables, uh, moderate amount of, of fish and chicken and dairy things like that, and then sweets and and junk food is at the top, of course, and that of course led to high amounts of grains and glutens and things that, that we've been talking about today. But what we really wanna advocate for our patients, and it, again, it's not really a question of which one is right, which one is wrong, but it's more of a question of what's gonna help the body function better. And you can see with the pyramid on the right, 
it's focused on vegetables and greens and and proteins water's even in there you don't even see water on 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 the other food pyramid uh, you want to focus on omega-3 fats not omega-6 fats so you get your omega-3 fats from uh, you know, wild Alaskan salmon, for instance, or from taking fish oils or EPA, DHA, those, those types of things. You know, herbs and spices are important. Organic teas and coffee and dark chocolate is, is, is actually has a lot, a lot of benefits. And so um, we just feel with our patients that a grain based diet is, is, is not the way to go. And we find that by eating a, a vegetable or a or a uh, you know like a diet that focuses on vegetables, essentially low carb, moderate protein, and a little bit higher ratios of fats. That seems to be what moves the needle for patients, keeps the inflammation low, keeps the weight under control. But you still can have the foods that you like. You still don't feel like you're suffering, and you you can live your life in a way that's that's positive and rewarding. So the inflammation transformation process we're talking about today, it, it involves diagnostic testing to identify the causes of poor gut health. And so there's several different things we can do. There's the functional blood chemistry that we run. That's probably the number one thing we start with. Usually for suspected gut issues, there'll be a some sort of a stool and saliva test that we do. There's also some genetic testing that that, that, that we can do that goes along with it. And it's, it just depends on, on what the symptoms are, what the complaints are, and uh, we'll custom tailor that to whatever needs that, that, that we find that, that you're looking for and, and what the testing determines. So first thing we need to do is we need to get the nutrition right. We have to remove and reduce pathogens. We, we want to balance gut bacteria and repair the intestinal lining. We'll have the ability to reintroduce foods and test certain foods that, that you may want to to eat because you like them or they taste good to you or there's there's whatever myriad of reasons why you would want to try certain foods. And you'll find that some foods work for you, some foods don't. So that's called an elimination diet, uh, which really isn't a diet, but uh, you take away all of the known problems with foods and then reintroduce one at a time so you can figure out if that particular food is good for you or bad for you. And then lastly, we want to feed good gut bacteria. And so if we do this in the right order, we can very quickly turn things around for you. We'll administer the correct supplements that unlock healing. And the goal is to have long-term health. We do that with coaching and also with lifestyle changes. If you want to find out how to improve your gut health or even just be tested to see if there's a problem potentially with your gut health or with inflammation, then we would love to talk with you. Feel free to book an appointment with the front desk receptionist. You can sit down and talk with one of our functional medicine experts. You can also give us a call at 951-225-4419 and we can also book that appointment for you. And we love to speak with spouses, friends, family members as well. We have a lot of families that do this together and they all get healthy at the same time. So it's really an amazing process uh, if families do it together. If you want more information, check out our website, www.growwithvitality.com. You can also follow us on social media at Facebook and Instagram, which is at Vitality Integrative Wellness. I really thank you for listening to our presentation today on gut health and inflammation, and thank you for listening.